thanks very much. So I say biomedical first, of course. And this is a, I think this illustration says enough. This is a woman I uh, saw last week in Tanzania, in rural Tanzania, who had come walking to a clinic for half a day uh, because she was, uh, she was extremely uh, ill um, and uh, probably has uh, Kaposi sarcoma on her, uh, on her lower extremities with a secondary infection. She also probably has TB. She had just been diagnosed with HIV, but in the whole province of Xinjiang, uh, there were no reagents for CD4 testing. Um, and then uh, when I wanted to put her on antiretrovirals, I was, uh, it took me a lot of trouble because you could only put somebody on antiretrovirals if there was a CD4 cell count available. And I think this really argues for, you don't want people to, to end up in this stage. Uh, so I really think uh, treatment is, is mandated. This is her tongue, a uh, picture that many of you will know. And this is the type of environment we're dealing with. This is very rural. People live in these little huts, and then they have to walk miles and miles and miles to get to a clinic. And then, uh, in the end, uh, they, they not always get what they come for. And in a way, treatment as prevention is a misleading name. And it, it really worked through also in this conference, because some people only speak about the prevention benefits. But in fact, the treatment benefits are much more important because virtually all HIV-infected individuals need to be treated anyhow for their own health. And we can best do this in a way that maximizes both the individual and public health benefits, which means as early as possible. And in fact, the new WHO guidelines, the 2013 guidelines, come close to treatment as prevention because they have so many categories that are excluded from the CD4 uh, threshold that they already amount almost to, to treatment as prevention. And um, there's also a finding in, in two YAVI cohorts where it was found that the median time to uh, to uh, a CD4 cell count of less than 500 in, in these cohorts was six months for men and eight months for women. So what are we talking about here? And the opportunity cost of sending people away who are not yet eligible for antiretroviral therapy outweigh the savings by far is my personal uh, con conviction. And as you see, the sick prioritize themselves. This is a silly thing in the WHO guidelines about prioritization of the sick, but when the sick come, of course you help them. But you don't necessarily find them by going out into communities. That's what you need to do to get the healthy ones. And if you look at the efficacy scale of, of, of uh, uh, interventions, te technological interventions, in, uh, at least from clinical trials, it's clear that treatment as prevention is by far the winner. And I, winner. And I must say that I, I was tempted to draw behavioral uh, somewhere, and it would have ended up below the vaccine trial, which only had 31% efficacy. I looked uh, at PubMed, uh, did a search actually yesterday uh, to look at behavioral interventions in HIV, and there were 4,672 articles. Of course, I read all of them last night. <laughs> But I can assure you, I haven't read all of them. I, 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 but very, very few of those, I, I, I tried to go quickly, had a hard biological endpoint. So you can change behavior, but still the people do catch HIV. Uh, and and I, I think the, 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 uh, the ones uh, that, that we saw were an exception and also not necessarily very convincing. Behavior change, uh, first of all, I, I acknowledge that behavior is an important determinant of the spread of HIV, but I do not believe it's an easy target. Uh, it's not impossible, but it, that's certainly not the case for everyone. And with all the efforts to discourage smoking and all the knowledge about its dire consequences, just imagine what would happen if smoking was an infectious disease. Women were liberated by a technological intervention oral and anticonceptives, which gave them the opportunity to change behavior, not the other way around. 90% of new HIV infections among MSM in my own country are estimated to take place before diagnosis of the index case. So 90% of the transmission comes from people who don't know their HIV status, and I don't think that's unique to this setting. So that means we have test to test, 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 test. And sexual risk behavior amongst MSM who are not aware of their infection is the most likely factor driving this epidemic. We have an MSM epidemic. And then, of course, you have to treat, 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 etc., etc. 
And uh, there's this behavioral study that was, uh, that was nested in the Temprano ANRS trial that uh, Francois talked about uh, yesterday in Ivory Coast. And uh, 12 months after inclusion, the proportion of subjects who had who were engaged in risky sex was 10% in the early treatment arm versus 12.8% in the standard R group. And they um, modeled that early R decreased the estimated risk of HIV transmission by 90% suggesting a major prevention benefit among seronegative sex partners. I, I don't understand how there can still be people that say that we have to wait for these effectiveness trials uh, before we roll out trial. Uh, there's no doubt, based on, on the data that we have, to doubt the efficacy of treatment as prevention on an individual basis. Like there's no reason to doubt the efficacy of condoms. So. It still hasn't. The limited effectiveness of condom programs has not led to hesitations about condoms as an essential component of the HIV prevention package. And Thailand has shown what is possible there. And we've seen uh, uh, these data before from, from KwaZulu Natal in a presentation from Til Barnhausen, showing that every 10% increase in, in antiretroviral coverage, there was a 17% decrease in individual risk. I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing that we should stop these effectiveness studies. I think they're pivotal to show us the way on how to do it, but they should not delay the planning and roll out of TASP. So why start early? Again, I do think that the individual health benefit is more important than the prevention benefit. It's, it's a moral obligation to treat people for this, uh, for this horrible infection. First of all, the biological plausibility. We have a virus that's raging havoc every day. There's 10 billion copies being made. Uh, it's bad for uh, a lot of organ systems. It doesn't make sense not to treat, except if the drugs are too toxic. And at a certain point in time, the drugs were too toxic. After, in, in, in 98, we found out about uh, lipodystrophy, etc., etc. And of course, we had to hold back uh, early treatment. But that's, there's no argument to do that now. People who complain about toxicity, toxicity the toxicity of HIV is a, lot, uh, is a lot greater than the toxicity of the agents that we're using. There's overwhelming evidence that early treatment increases survival. In fact, when treatment is started early enough and the CD4 cell count is kept above 500, life expectancy is similar to that of the non-HIV infected. And that's another thing we should keep in mind when we uh, 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 defer treatment. We can keep people healthy, we can give, give people normal life expectancy. So that's not a, a trivial thing. And interestingly, uh, recently uh, another paper appeared in Clinical Infectious Diseases that actually showed that AIDS-defining illnesses were uh, more common in, in individuals with a CD4 cell count between 500 and 749 uh, than in those with higher CD4 cell numbers. So, so there is an increased risk for, for disease, HIV-related disease, in, uh, in people also with quite high CD4 cell count numbers, actually numbers that are often not uh, in the normal range in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Most people in Sub-Saharan Africa are lower than 750. And then also the capacity uh, to, to restore uh, the CD4 cell count uh, differs greatly uh, between, between CD4 cell strata. The lower you start, the longer it takes to come into the safe zone. And the safe zone is not just the zone that protects you from getting opportunistic infections. The safe zone is the zone that can give you a normal life expectancy. And this, I, I love this trial. It's, it's an old trial, but it's a trial in infants lo looking at, at early therapy, uh, ex uh, treatment at, at uh, the moment of diagnosis um, in, in infants versus the uh, uh, deferred treatment according to the, the then time guidelines. And I think this is actually the, uh, the best argument for, uh, for early treatment. These are infants, but they are, I think it, it's a principle. And it, it takes me back to the, uh, to the battle cry of David Ho, uh, of the mid-90s. It's the virus, stupid. Well, another reason to start early. There's no immune reconstitution syndrome. Do you know how many people died in the early days of treatment in Africa from Im immune reconstitution syndrome? 10% of people putting on heart, put on heart. There's absolutely no reason to, to tolerate that. It reduces TB incidence, important for the individual, but also for society. And here's a slide from a, a paper by, uh, by uh, Stephen Lawn and, uh, and, and Robin Wood. And then there are some 
Uh, other benefits, early treatment may lead to what we call a functional cure in a subset of patients who are treated during primary or acute infection. And there are several papers out on this. And if we ever uh, will be able to, uh, to cure HIV, these attempts will be most successful in this particular population. Forget about all this purging of reservoirs in patients who have been infected for a long time. That's not going to work. But people who have virtually no reservoir, there we have a chance. And this is a slide from, uh, from uh, a study that Jintanat Anamoranic is, is leading in Thailand, uh, where she, they, they meticulously follow people uh, with primary infection, put them on treatment as soon as they come in. And what it shows is in the people who were very, uh, treated very early, the fubic ones and two, you don't see the, the wiping out of CD4 T cells in the sigmoid during acute infection. If you look at uh, the FIBIC-1 subjects, those are the subjects that you catch when they only are ANA positive. Uh, almost all of these subjects had undetectable integrated HIV DNA and peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells. And lastly, uh, there was also restricted integration of HIV DNA and memory CD4 T cells during acute HIV in the study. So people who were treated within 15 days uh, after infection, actually uh, they couldn't find it. And then the societal benefits of early treatment. We've talked about the prevention benefit, but a very important one is actually that early treatment is health system slide. People who say that when we scale up further, it will be a big burden on the health systems, they're, they're completely wrong. It's actually going to relieve the health systems. If you treat healthy people, you don't need a health system. You can have community workers, et cetera, et cetera. So it, this is really what allows health systems to task shift. We can't task shift. Now, if you have people like that woman I showed you walking into your clinic, and in that clinic, several of those people walk in every day. There's no doctor in that clinic, so they, they actually put them in a bed, and, uh, and that's about it. Um, yeah, so so that, that's definitely not uh, the way forward if we, if we want to scale up. And lastly, this is my last slide. Uh, this is uh, another boy in that uh, clinic. It's, uh, it's called Isaac. I saw him uh, five weeks ago. He was, he's 14 years old. He has HIV, he has TB, he had six CD4 cells. And uh, we really don't want that. Thank you very much.